Change is the only constant. In an ever-evolving world, change is inevitable, anticipated, expected. Join us as we discuss current issues, connect with top SMEs as we talk about topics that matter. Coming to you every month on air with Change, brought to you by Human Cap. follow us as well. Do share this event on your social media accounts to help others benefit on the topic we are discussing today. Should there be any questions, please feel free to post them in the comment section and we will do our best to address them later on in the Q&A segment. On Air with Change is a platform where we discuss the current trends or issues that are impacting Malaysians. Previously, we have discussed topics such as employee engagement, mental health, unemployed graduates and the future of work. In this edition, we'll be talking about the impetus of technology. Where are we? We will be focusing on the state of technology adoption in the Malaysian job market and the key steps to move forward. In the time we were hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been many statements and posts being shared on social media, which state that instead of the chief technology officer or the chief innovations officer, COVID-19 has been a major catalyst for digitalization for many organizations. Surely, many of us would agree as the pandemic has forced many, if not all, organizations to embrace digitalization. Although most states are already in phase four of the National Recovery Plan, organizations should still be wary of the unpredictable effects of COVID-19 on their business planning and organizational strategies. Most of which would need to hit the ground running with suitable innovations and improvements to steer their organizations in the right direction once the global economy is back in full swing. Much has been said about the technological advancements, which seem to be popping up almost on a daily basis with things such as machine learning, artificial intelligence, and Internet of Things at the forefront. Without a doubt, innovators are always seeking to help ease the life of everyday users and create a more efficient global environment, helping solve any simple or complex problems that may arise. But how do these advancements affect the job market? 
many of us would be familiar with the term of Industrial Revolution or IR 4.0 in short in Malaysia, which has been around for many years. But do we actually understand what it means and how it impacts us? With all these advancements being made in the technology sector in such a short span of time, there has been many who say that in the near future, many jobs will become obsolete and regular human beings will be replaced by more efficient machines who can do the jobs better. Also, where does Malaysia stand as compared to other Southeast Asian countries who are continuously developing and embracing these changes? These are some of the questions we will be exploring in this session of On Air with Change. So without further ado, let's meet our two esteemed panelists who will be discussing this topic with us today. Firstly, we have Mr. Rob Fraser, Executive Director of Yasa Global Limited. Rob is a global industry and market development leader with 30 years of expertise in sectors such as high technology, global services, and human capital, to name a few. Thank you for joining us today, Rob. Nice having you with us. Thank you, Adam. Thank you to Human Cap for inviting me over. Nice to meet you again. Dr. Asni, hello. hello. Assalamualaikum. Good afternoon. No worries. And also, we have uh, Dr. Azni Zarina Taha, Senior Lecturer in the Department of Management, Faculty of Business and Economics in University of Malaya, who is actively involved in strategic projects and research consultancy. She is the coordinator for the Masters of Business Management program and a member of Center Industry 4.0 in UM. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Azni, and pleasure having you with us. Thank you for having me. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and a very good evening to everybody. All right. Great to meet both our panelists today, and I think all of us are eager to jump straight into the questions. So let's uh, go ahead and start off with the first question of the day. As I mentioned earlier in the opening, uh, we have heard this term IR 4.0 many times before, and we may not fully understand what it means. So could we have a brief explanation by both Dr. Azni and Rob to help us understand what is IR 4.0 to Malaysia? Uh, probably we'll begin with Dr. Azmi. Can you help us to explain a bit? I was hoping Rob would start. <laughs> <laughs> Lady first. <laughs> um, um, we're looking at yeah. industry. Oh, uh, I'm hearing a bit of feedback. Okay, so uh, the industry 4.0 is basically looking at the advancements in manufacturing. And um, it's... To me, uh, I like to focus on the strategy part. Uh, when we are looking at digitization or adoption of new technology, uh, right now, uh, it is very, very critical for companies to be very adaptive, uh, flexible, and agile uh, in their tech adoption. And uh, it's not just at an employee level readiness that we have to look into, uh, even at top management, yeah, when we're looking at small, uh, medium-sized industries, uh, for me, uh, the readiness of the top management to adopt new technologies is very important. I mean, advancements are happening a bit rapid at the moment, and everybody has to be very open to change. Okay. Thanks a lot for that clarification, Dr. Azni. We now will head over to Rob. Probably, what do you think about IR 4.0? Yeah, whatever she said, that's what I mean as well. <laughs> it's like a, uh, thanks, Doctor. It was very, very well put. Uh, there's probably only one of one or two things I would like to add to that. I think, as Doctor As Asni mentioned, you know, it's it's the advent of what they call the design to print or design to build culture. So once upon a time, you know, the first revolution, industry revolution, when coal was you know found in England, uh, Wales. And uh, North North UK, they decided to make a lot of factories. Just one minute, uh, Doctor Ashton, can you just take over, please? There seem, I seem to have a sound problem here. Ah, okay. So uh, the revolution of industry is uh, basically, uh, you know, once upon a time we had the coal, and then we had the steam, and then uh, we have advancements in manufacturing, and now there is a high level of interconnectedness uh, where you are looking at technologies uh, such as Internet of Things, uh, M2M. Uh, there's so many jargons out there. But basically yeah. what we're trying to say here is that uh, the amount of... Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> my lights went off. <laughs> so many digital problems. Give me a second. Okay, got it. Okay, so... Um, 
Um, as I was saying, yeah, uh, the amount of technological advancements in uh, manufacturing and supply chain uh, is now making, uh, you know, the changes more rapid. And COVID nineteen has just pushed uh, the timeline a lot more faster. So, it's making it, uh, you know, the the need for change and the propensity of change right now is very very high. Uh, where companies really need to uh, be very quick at pivoting and adopting uh, into new technologies. Uh, it's challenging times, but also very exciting. Okay. Rob, are you with us? Yeah, sorry, as I was saying, I had to just uh, uh, fix some sound issues there. Uh, yeah, so as, Dr. as I mentioned, it's, it, a lot of it's adaptive, and I was um, highlighting the fact that this is about... Um, um, you know, moving on from the first industrial revolution where you would just make the same shirt, same color over and over again, right? And of course, there's been a lot of changes and, and improvements, but Industry 4.0 basically is the, uh, I would like to call the introduction of how the IT industry works in manufacturing into the rest of all the sectors. So back in the good old days of Dell, you basically, you know, decide what you want and Dell will make it exactly how you want it. So now every other sector from uh, from aerospace, automotive, to uh, even making houses are adopting the same, the same principle. So that's basically called the build, print, to, uh, design, to, uh, design to build, design to uh, print uh, culture. From an right. industrial standpoint, from Malaysia, it's, you know, there's, there, there, is, um, uh, there are three perspectives, I guess. One is the optimistic, yeah. one is the pessimistic, and another one is uh, perhaps my take on it. Should we get into that now, or is it a different, uh, different topic? Okay, we'll go into that now shortly. So okay. thanks a lot, uh, Rob and Dr. Azni, for giving us that clarification. I'm sure our viewers would appreciate the input as well. So <clears throat> I think, sorry. So moving on, uh, we'll have a little more insight on the climate of the current job market, I would say. In the olden days, for example, farmers would have benefited from the invention of automated tools, which helped them decrease the manual labor needed to harvest their crops, per se. Surely the rapid increase in available technology today would have an effect on the job market. So I would like to get both your inputs on this question, which is, how are jobs different or how have they changed with the adoption of digital technology today? So Rob, probably you can get the ball rolling on this one. Okay, so if I may, I actually, uh, it's an interesting question. I just recently uh, completed a project with the uh, development center of OECD, the base out of Paris. And we did a um, study for industrial transformation for the Egyptian government or Egypt basically focusing on the technology industry, um, a few sectors, including medical devices and such like, and technology obviously as a major disruption. From a de developmental standpoint, people would say that Egypt is significantly uh, ahead of others in Africa, somewhat behind Mal Malaysia when it comes to technology and, and, and such like. But the same, the issues are quite sim similar. Of course, I've been here for over a quarter of a century in Malaysia, and I have a few comments on that. But basically, the, the, there are the trends which you mentioned earlier, Adam. I think Dr. Rasti mentioned the same thing as well. And then that is digitalization, COVID. There's also a, a couple more. I mean, one is uh, a new one, which is uh, ESG investments, investments in environmental, sustainable government uh, governance. Um, you know, that was a, what, $12 trillion industry yeah, three years ago. Now it's almost 20, less than three years. Uh, what, what does that mean? It means that people are pulling money out of all companies and putting a lot of company uh, money into everything else, which is sustainable, not just from a technology and, and, and ecological standpoint, but also in terms of governance. Uh, also, that's making a big change in uh, in technology. So, and that means you know um, the old jobs where you were a technician and in, in, in mechanic uh, in the past, they'll be they'll be gone in the future. That's why, in fact, Industry 4.0 was created by Germans because they know that an average car has about what two, three thousand moving parts for in the ice environment, internal combustion engine. They're all gone, so you need a, you need a new supply chain. So, of course, as part of the process, uh, you know, other other parts of Industry 4.0 came out about as well, which they're designed to print uh, aspect of it. Um, and the other part also, when it comes to, if I can just go in, go into digitalization. Um, Digitalization, now there are what, roughly 20 billion connected devices. 
but almost half of that actually doesn't involve uh, human beings. But you know, it's machine to machine, which is basically Internet of Things. Uh, having said that, a quarter of our smartphone, tablets, uh, PC is now less than 20%, roughly 15% of all device use. And more than half of the data are not being produced or processed through tablets, smartphones, and IoT. Uh, what does it mean? That means, uh, whereas we were pushing 15, 20, 25 years ago, skills on your personal computer, laptop, or whatever else, that's going to die pretty soon. Everyone's going to be working with mobile devices, wearables, tablets, and a plethora of different, um, different platforms. So learning Windows, learning Android is not going to be enough. It's going to be a lot more complicated and a lot more, uh, a lot more specialized as well by, by a second. Uh, service sector automation, um, 15, 20 years ago, was a big thing. BPO, ITO, centralization, shared service outsourcing, and uh, decapitalization of service and, and manufacturing sectors. was a big move from the mid-90s, starting from Y2K, all the way to internet, cloud, mobile, social. Uh, now it's also gone. It's gone now, basically. All the call centers. I mean, how, when was the last time you spoke to a call center for a bank or a telco? So that's going to get a bit more. Uh, uh, that, that'll change a lot more as well. So everything now is becoming like an e-commerce. Banks are becoming like uh, e-commerce. We, everything is huge. Yeah. E-commerce uh, e now is uh, roughly 25 trillion. Yeah, yeah, the B2B aspect of that is about 20 billion. The B2C portion is is quite small. So that means the back end of all businesses around the world are being carved out and replaced by uh, replaced by machines. Having said all that, there is a huge, huge war for talent. You can go to Germany, and they, they need 5 million people they can't find. You go to US, similar numbers as well. Yeah. So when people come to Malaysia and say you don't have the talent, you can say, well, every country has a lack of talent. The, the, the question now is, what are you going to do about it? So, so, so there, are two, there are two perspectives of this, right? Someone is, oh, we need to be technologically advanced. That is definitely uh, um, a case. But we also need to be competitive. And those, and those, those two perspectives from a talent standpoint is where our challenges today from perspective of industry, employers, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and the employees. The last one I'm going to highlight uh, it's on the technology side of, as well, because I was part of the agency which built the technology industry. Um, you know, there are uh, one of the big one of the big things which is now overtaking business is social media. I mean, out of nowhere, in less than a few years, TikTok's almost a billion users. Netflix only has 200 million users, but almost yeah. all of the revenue uh, and bandwidth in the world. So these are the things that we need to upgrade ourselves if we were maintaining ourselves into the technology sector. This technology right. sector is important because if we don't become competitive in the technology se sector, you have no chance of being competitive or even useful in the industry 4.0 uh, arena as well. There's a whole menu of different things we need to do. Um, but basically, industry 4.0, um, the good thing about it is it, we, it enables Malaysia to have another push into the manufacturing sector. I think the country got very excited about services. It's just fantastic. But you'll find that right. everyone in the world realizing manufacturing is the most important part and we need to get we need, we need to get into it properly. All right, I'm gonna stop you right here, Rob, so we can get uh, some opinions from Dr. Azmi as well. So Dr. Azmi, a same question to you as well. What do you think in terms of changes with adoption technology in terms of the job market and how the job market is going <clears throat> is uh, change a little bit. I think uh, we are, with technology, I think the repetitive or redundancy type of work uh, will be replaced by technology. But uh, the human factor, the human touch, uh, creativity, although uh, we, are, we have artificial intelligence, but the level of uh, development in artificial intelligence is still not uh, where human critical thinking is there yet so if you want to focus on education at the moment for all our students uh, exposure to case study uh, the ability to set parameters and understand you know for example if you want to do mass customization or when you teach uh, strategic thinking yeah you can have all the data readily available uh, maybe all these sensors can collect all the data but who's going to digest the data 
for machine to AI to be able to come up with a deductive thinking, they need the the amount of data needed is surmountable. However, when it comes to human being, we have uh, our thinking. If you give them the right fundamentals, the creativity of humans is still something that technology has not keep up with. So, uh, I always believe that in education, we have to provide students the platform to uh, look at the fundamentals and also be a uh, prone towards change and innovation. And if the students themselves have a high level of creativity and critical thinking, uh, their talent is complementary to the technologies that is available out there. Uh, you know, uh, whether you, and even if you want to do uh, design, there's still a lot of human feel to it, you know, even in advertising, even social media. And what I've seen the trend right now is that, uh, you know, the growth of uh, entrepreneurs is very high. Uh, you know, um, many companies like Grab and all that still really depend on human resource, but the shape of human resource is a little bit different with the geek economy of the, you know, whatever uh, different technologies, even in manufacturing also, yeah, there's still some human element to it. We just have to be uh, creative enough in finding ways to adapt to the technology. And to me, um, Technology does not replace human; it just mm -hmm. elevates. I don't. I don't really believe that humans are replaceable. Uh, but with the technology, we grow faster, better if we allow uh, the technology to support us. And I think that is the general mindset right now. Yeah, we are always thinking the stance that technology is replacing human. It's not. It's supportive. To me, technology is still an empowerment. You know, uh, the amount of learning that we have right now, the amount of exposure, even in classes, when you come up with a study, I don't rely on textbooks anymore. You can just Google it or YouTube it, you know. It's just how you use the technology. So for me, uh, I'm not really... I mean, Industry 4.0 is an enabler for human growth. It is not a competitor. A competitor. Uh, many people assume that Technology is a competitor, and I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't believe in it. Because uh, without technology, we will not have grown as much as we have right now. Okay. Thanks a lot, Dr. Azni, for that. I think it showed a lot with what technology can help us do, essentially, instead of being an enemy to us. It's basically going to be, like you said, an enabler, making us basically progress further and more efficiently as well. So that takes away some of the stigma that I think some people might have with using technology in their jobs being replaced and things like that. So, all right, great. So uh, I think moving on, we have seen many countries who achieved great success by adopting technology. So countries such as China, Japan, South Korea, some of the Asian giants who have led the way for quite some time. So they've known continuous innovations in things like, let's say, WeChat messenger applications in China, automotive and smartphone manufacturing in Japan and South Korea, respectively. Now we see that uh, Southeast Asian countries are rising following suit, such as Thailand and Indonesia, to name a few. Which leads us to the question, are Malaysian organizations lagging behind compared to their Southeast Asian counterparts? So I think uh, with this question, I'll ask Dr. Azni to begin with again. So what do you think about this question, Dr. Azni? Uh, whether we're lagging? Yeah, whether we're lagging behind compared to company, uh, countries such as Indonesia, probably Thailand okay. in Southeast Asia. Okay, um, I think we're not lagging. It's just that uh, when you are in a country where uh, the infrastructure is still very bare minimal, like uh, Indonesia or Tha uh, not Thailand, maybe Vietnam. I think uh, Vietnam is a more of a threat rather than Thailand. Uh, but okay. when you're looking at a, a place, I mean, when you, you're an organization or you're an MNC, your key decision is looking into where should I invest? When you are in Malaysia, the infrastructure is a bit fixed. So to build from scratch and to create total new systems is not easy. So uh, I think one success story that Malaysia has is the Toyota uh, new plant where it's totally uh, mechanized, uh, Industry 4.0 already. Uh, that is an example. Yeah, I think the problem with Malaysia right now is transforming older manufacturing plant into uh, industry 4.0, whereas in Indonesia or Vietnam, you can just totally do what Toyota do. Just pop a new one, all the machines are fully M2M, uh, sorry, machine to machine, uh, fully integrated into the uh, internet of things. And, uh, you know, I think in that sense, 
uh, that's where their competitive advantage. But one thing Malaysia have that uh, the other two countries don't have is the uh, logistical infrastructure that, you know, location, location, location. Malaysia is still the best location. So in that sense, competitive advantage in the sense of location, we, we win hands down. However, in the freshness of the, you know, the ability to build a, a whole plant that is immediately industry 4.0, uh, we lose a little bit there. But uh, we still have an edge, if you ask me. All right. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Azni. I think, uh, Rob, what do you think about this question? Do you feel that organizations in Malaysia are lagging behind or is this statement currently false? Uh, I think everyone's lagging. You know, I don't think any one country is ahead behind in Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia, I see as a continent. If you compare it to India, for example, it has half the population, but the GDP per, ca uh, per capita is much higher. In fact, the GDP of Southeast Asia is larger than India. So let's not forget, you know, this is, uh, you know, one of the few regions in the world where you have 10 countries and 30 major cities. Uh, so the only reason why it's behind China is because China is a behemoth when it comes to population, both demand and supply. Uh, Southeast Asia has not yet consolidated its demand. When it does, it will start taking off. And each country has a, has a role to play. So Malaysia, for example, uh, and I think we've discussed it before, has you know, been uh, doing something very well that China, Taiwan, Japan and were, were doing a long time ago, which is to have first world infrastructure and, th and uh, third world costs. So that's a great combination. And you'll find that uh, many countries uh, in Southeast Asia have not evolved out of that yet, other than Singapore, because Singapore is, is a city state and they've done very well by leveraging on that. But when I mean, you get to a larger population with a larger geography and different types of groups of stakeholders to look after, it then becomes the, the process of diversification. So that is, diversification is the key to moving out of the middle income trap that we have uh, in Malaysia. So naturally, as Dr. Asi mentioned, you know, technology, techno technological advanced uh, advancement is good for us because it forces us to move away from the third world cost mentality into the first world labor mentality. The, the concern we have in, in this journey is, you know, it's institutional, it's economic, maybe even political, but that's not what we're here to talk about, right? Every country in the world has gone through the same process that we have, no exception. Some are bloody, uh, unlike, unlike Malaysia, it's generally bloodless. We're gonna go through that development process and we're next on that list to go into it. So yes, Vietnam is rising because Vietnam is behind and they're catching up and they're doing the same thing Malaysia did, which is first world infrastructure, getting better, then third world costs. They have great programmers, they have great things. I remember when uh, China was going through the same thing as well. A lot of projects moved from Malaysia in the late uh, 90s, middle 2000s, after five, 10 years, they all came back to Malaysia. Why? Because we're just better at things that they can never be better at. And everyone has their place uh, in the sense. So sometimes I like to criticize ourselves because we don't know others as well. So we see our, 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 our own faults and say, oh, we made a mistake. We're the worst in the world. No, we're not the worst in the world. I've studied many countries. Dr. Narasni has studied many countries. There are many, many worst, worst countries in Malaysia. Malaysia is a great country, right? That's, we need to make sure that's very clear. There's some things we're not doing right. Look at the most powerful countries in the world. They're doing worse things than, than what we are. So I don't, think we're not, I don't think we're lagging. I think we have a place in the sun. We just need to all agree in well, where it is. And maybe we're industry 4.0 is it? A 4.0 yeah, I have a sneaking suspicion it is. Um, from, from a technical standpoint, I, I think as I mentioned earlier, we need to look at diversification. Of course, Malaysia is quite successful. We have, we're harnessing our social diversity. We're har harnessing our infrastructure diversity. And Malaysia has one of the largest ports in the world in terms of volume, larger than thousands of others, including most Europeans, most Americans. Our ports are the largest. And it's a great infrastructure, which we're leveling on invisibly, but we're just not uh, taking, taking advantage. Uh, uh, of that, um, the, the other one that's a di diversity is we are you know we, we are gradually moving from uh, uh, Banda to Lua Banda to uh, to to the regional areas. That is where the big push was, right? So the first big push are the corridors. Of course, corridors now are the fashion because they're too small. Now we're going to daerah by daerah, from district to district. So these are the these are the things which will take. 
time and will be generational. And you find other countries around Southeast Asia doing that? No, nobody is doing what we're doing. So that is our advantage, but it takes time. Then the third one is generational, right? There's a generation of experts going from the silent, major, uh, the silent generation to the boomers to the Gen X, which is my generation. Then the next generation will take over. They will make this country go to the next level. I, you know, there's the astral generation, and after that, there's the YouTube generation. And they're as good as anyone in the world. They just need to be uh, need to be properly organized. But we can't just flick on a switch like we flick on a TV and expect things to change. They will be a bit messy. We will make a dip. We will go go ahead. Um, the other thing I want to I'm going to finish up with is something which happened about uh, ten years ago. Was the establishment of uh, the selection of ten or eleven industrial sectors. You know, I think it's called the ETP or something like that to the 10th Malaysia plan. Even though uh, we wouldn't call it a smashing success, it did the right thing, which is let's just stop the noise and all the nonsense. There's a dozen things we're gonna be good at sooner or later, and we're gonna drive that. We just need to continue this. Yes, it's 10 years. I mean, look at all these things we started 15 years ago with the corridors, right? Only now it's starting to bear fruit. So, so yes, there's some patience are required, but at the same time, I think, uh, the populists and investors uh, require more action. And that's where it, it gets very interesting. But the general statement of us being laggards, I think it's, uh, uh, it's a little bit of self-defeatism, which we need to kind of get rid of in the vocabulary. Okay. Thanks a lot, Rob, for clarifying that. And I think uh, I, I had another question, but I think you've already answered it in that statement as well, because I just wanted to understand how we can better ourselves moving forward. And I think you've answered that by saying that we are already in a progression, making ourselves better as well. So in terms of Dr. Anu, do you have anything to add with regards to how we're progressing or how do organizations probably need to redesign themselves to keep up with the changes that we are seeing at the moment? I think when it comes to uh, our organization, um, to me, is we have all the infrastructure and we have the, I think the government's been very, very proactive in promoting uh, the level of adoption uh, and it's getting traction. And I think COVID-19 has pushed a lot of companies that has taken, has put in, uh, has put uh, the Industry 4.0 technologies on the back seat, but now it's, uh, the the COVID actually there is a silver lining there I guess in a sense that it has pushed a lot of companies that has been postponing the decision to expedite the decision so um, I mean to me we are doing quite well it's just well, now that we got the COVID behind us was pushing us uh, forward way faster yeah. than what we ex anticipated before okay all right thanks a lot Adhazni. Uh I think uh both for your input and Rob's input as well. We'll be taking a quick break. Just a reminder, if you are not done so, to please leave a like and follow to our Facebook and LinkedIn pages, Human Capital Consulting. We'll be back with you in two minutes. Change is the only constant. Organizations need to constantly change and evolve to remain relevant and to move forward no matter the industry. In order for a change to be successful, it is important that you know where your people stand in accepting this change. Without this knowledge, your endeavor may be met with resistance, which will cause your effort to crumble, and a high chance your change initiative will fail. HumanCap presents Change Compass, your beacon of change. The Change Compass helps your organization to manage change in a more effective manner by helping you understand the readiness of your organization, plan the change management initiative, and measure its effectiveness. We do this by first engaging your people. Human Cap Proprietary Survey Questionnaire helps you to understand how well the change initiative is perceived and understood by your employees. Once we have received the feedback, all necessary data will be translated into a dashboard which will provide you with a great level of understanding and visibility of your organization's readiness based on departments, divisions, units and locations. The Change Compass would assist you in making key decisions 
on the types of change management interventions that are required based on where your organization stands on the readiness scale. The Change Compass, your beacon of change, helps power a smooth transition of change for your organization and your people. Human Cap, enabling change, empowering people. To know more about our solutions, email us at inquiry at humancap.com.my. Welcome back. And if you have just joined us today on On Air with Change, we're discussing the topic of impetus of technology. Where are we? Where we focus on the state of technology adoption in the Malaysian job market and the key steps to move forward. With us, we have Mr. Rob Kayser, Executive Director of Yasa Global Limited, and Dr. Azni Zarina Taha, Senior Lecturer in the Department of Management, Faculty of Business and Economics at University of Malaya. We have just covered the topic of climate of the job market and the organizational readiness of ASEAN organizations before the break. Uh, now let's turn our attention to how all this affects individuals and their skill sets as well. So uh, Rob uh, and Dr. Azni, I think uh, I would say employees are the cornerstone of any organizations. So how are organizations currently equipping their employees with the right knowledge and skill sets as digitalization is becoming the norm? So uh, probably Dr. Azmi, I can have your take on this first. Uh, when we are managing change, um, we give the employee uh, the right training, yeah, uh, clear communication, uh, what is the trajectory of change, uh, you know, what is the benefits of the adoption of technology. I think mainly what we need to really educate everybody is that uh, technology is an enabler for individual growth. And if you can embrace uh, this technology and be creative in the utilization of the technology uh, individuals can really really be uh, you know if you compare once upon a time um, how i was doing lecture and the way i'm doing lecture now it has transformed quite substantially yeah? Um, yeah. the wealth of information and the real time of information also um, is very uh, it's really a lot mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the role that I, I focus on students is how do you navigate through the technology? How do you find technology that will solve your problem? Uh, and that type of uh, criticalness is the key uh, for every individual. If you are very critical and you're very uh, open to accepting uh, new things, if we can indoctrinate, uh, if we can ingrain that in the younger generation and even the older generation, that you know, everything is uh, complementary, and if you can collaborate with technology and if you think of technology as a person, uh, then you can really grow. It's more of a mindset rather than anything else. So, all right, thank you, Dr. Azni. Uh, I think Rob, uh, can we have your take on this as well in terms of uh, the question that just asked? This is getting uh, uh, the labor force and workforce ready for the digital economy, right? You mentioned. Yes. Okay. So, so you know, but it, it goes back to help them prepare. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it goes back to what uh, Dr. Rasti mentioned also before the break, and which is about uh, you know start first with the organizational design. So if the organizational design is not correct, the rest will not uh, will not follow correctly. That's that's really the. Uh, really, the most the most important part. If the business model relies on digitalization, then it requires everyone, especially the frontliners and the supervisors, to be digital natives. So, so one of the things that uh, you'll see, as uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier, most of e-commerce and B two B, which is basically what digitalization is about, um, is and, and that's invading every aspect of business, is actually a back end. Right, so nine nine tenths of everything which is digital is the back end aspect of it, and that's where you need actually most most um, most most of the people. 
and, and the business model of the back end, as Dr. Rasti mentioned, is artificial intelligence. Um, so I'll step back a bit. A, a lot of what's happening in Malaysia is actually based on this transformation, which I mentioned, you know, going from top heavy, uh, top, not top heavy, but you know, more top heavy into a more diverse economy. And there are three kind of uh, three three aspects to it. Well, the three versions of one dimension, which is um, liberalization. And I'm not promoting liberalization. If you know me, I'm not really a big fan of it. But that's the reality of, of, of the world. So some sectors like technology in Malaysia is totally liberalized, right? If, if company A from Afghanistan wants to make a computer in Malaysia, go ahead. The second one is totally protected. So you can say automotive is in that category or similar industries and some are in between such as banking and such like and and those three areas define the innovation cycle of whatever sector we're talking about and those three innovation cycles will then dictate the level of change and transformation because what we're talking about here is change and transformation firstly of the investor second second part of the gov uh, the governance structure it could be trustees or board members or whatever else senior management and operations so if you're looking at those which are heavily uh, heavily protected, then you'll have a much lower form of innovation and their form of digitalization is much lower as well. So those are the ones which, you know, you can do your best, but it is restricted by, I, I would say, you know, constraints or, or, or motivating factors. Then you have the ones which are openly, uh, openly, how should I say, uh, unliberated un totally liberated so for example all the manufacturing plants which serve a global market all the technology firms which are serving the global market including malaysian firms we have many good ones i know everyone says grabs i think a boring company to me is still a malaysian company and they need people like crazy and what do they do they take him from as early as possible they train them as early as possible and then they try to retain as, as much as possible and then they and then they of course lose them to competitors and they take and, and vice, vice versa. That's what you call the dog eat dog perspective, right? And then, then you have others which are more on the manufacturing side, which is more like hopefully what our industry 4.0 uh, happens is uh, because our manufacturing sector and many of our protected sectors are quite rigid because we're still in this infrastructure low cost perspective, we're not really training the talent enough. We're training them just to do repetitive work, which Dr. Ashley mentioned quite adequately earlier. Not good at that anymore. You know, that's going to be for somebody else. In fact, nobody will, should be doing it, but we definitely should not be doing that. But somehow this kind of work is landed upon us. What we need to do, right, and what's, and what's starting to happen is the reemergence of what was practiced in the early 70s, what was considered, how should I say, very boring, and now it's the most exciting thing in the world. Everyone's trying to emulate, and that's the apprenticeship system. You take someone from high school, you give them a lifelong career, industry 4.0 or IT or finance or whatever. You pay for all their education. You're paying wages, not much, but enough to be an employee. That's what's happening around the world. So, of course, the Germans, they call it TVET, right? So TVET for them is two things, industry-wide apprenticeship and the TVET. When it comes to Malaysia, we do the TPAP, we kind of forgot about the apprenticeship aspect of it. But I think it's, not, it's now starting to wake up. And you'll find that the reason why these advanced companies are advanced, because two out of every three employees you get very paid, very well in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and such like, go through the very same system. We call it the dual education uh, uh, system in Switzerland, or DVET, dual vocational education and training in, uh, in Germany. So this is a really a great way of, of, of developing not just talent, but also entire careers for, for people who will never job hop, they'll never leave. And it's also a great way to make sure everyone's on the same page. You may have 100 companies, 1,000 companies in the same industry, and they all uh, hold themselves to the same high global standard. So one of the things which I see as emerging and a great tool is to separate academia. Right, Dr. Ashton and Dean is like her. Their job is to tell industry what to do, not to follow industry. Their job is to tell industry, huh? You follow me. Okay. If if people in academia cannot do do that, like Dr. Ashton, then maybe respectfully they don't belong there, right? Everyone else, everyone else goes through a system of being taught by industry, led 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 by industry, and that's how you 
how you close, I wouldn't say close the gap, but make the gap closer. Because if you look at great countries uh, around the world who do this, even Germany, for example, they do have a talent gap. Everyone, as I mentioned, has a talent gap, no matter how advanced or not advanced their, their technology. But I think the apprenticeship system combined with stricter standards in, the, in academia is really how things will, will, will move, irrespective of whether it's liberalized or protected and, and, or, or such like. But the unprotected or the liberalized sectors or the unprotected sectors are the ones who will benefit the most. Because they're the ones who need the labor uh, more than anybody else. They really are desperate around the world. And if you can solve that problem in Malaysia and enterprises in Malaysia who can adopt the system, um, they'll be the winners of the future. They're the ones who can okay. organize labor properly. And of course, their business. All right. All right. Thanks, Rob. And I think after getting the input from both you and Dr. Azni and understanding how organizations are trying to keep up or personally how everybody should be basically promoting themselves in terms of progressing in their careers as well, this might be a continuation question and something that we might have touched on already, but what should the employees themselves be doing to stay relevant in a technology-driven era? And probably Rob, you can start on with this as well. Well, oh, that is the toughest question because there are, you refer to Malaysians, right? Or people living in Malaysia, 33 million <laughs> individuals. <laughs> so, so, you know, um, it, it's a very difficult general answer because a lot of, a lot of, um, are you referring to employees or future employees or both? Uh, I think both just in general for those probably employees currently in, probably planning to join in the employment line. Okay. All right, fair enough. So, so the, the, the strange thing about Malaysia, and, and, and it's a good thing, I, I remember I was talking to friends who are, who are economists from around the world, all the, the usual names, the not usual global NGOs. There was a great fear that Malaysia's employ, unemployment may spike because of COVID, right? From three, whatever, two point, whatever, 2.9, 3.2, whatever it was, to seven, six. It, it never touched that. It was like the most four point something else, definitely well under five. So that means, yes, there are a lot of unemployed, there's a lot of deaths, there's a lot of misery. This is something which uh, we all still grapple with. I don't, it, it's unfathomable. Right? If you see the numbers and the people with the white flags, uh, it's all very sad. But having, you know, put, putting that uh, into consideration, uh, we have more or less. Uh, survived so far. We never know next year, right? Everyone last year thought that 2020 will be a bounce year. Now everyone's saying with booster and uh, health technology next year will be, will be a bounce. So assuming that's the case, then we're looking at uh, uh, a brighter future. You know, back in 2016, 17, everyone's talking about the inverted curve, you know, the, the inverted, inverted bond yield. Everyone studied that and say, we heard a certain, hit a certain thing, there'll be a disaster and and that probably would have happened. That probably would have happened, right? But now with COVID and all the other things, that would have that happened anyway. So now we now now it's the bounce. I think employees, future employees, should expect some kind of recovery. If it's not next year, but 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 soon after. I know everyone's worried about China. Everyone's worried about Evergrande, and everyone's worried about all the politics in Russia and Middle East and U.S. But if you look at history, it's, it's never ending. But you look at Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia, and as a cluster of you know, uh, various various mm -hmm. economies of different uh, um, and varied strengths and weaknesses, but mostly strengths, there is great opportunity. So the first thing I tell people is to is to look around. This is not Malaysia anymore. This is Southeast Asia. That's the first thing you need, you need to understand. Malaysian companies are struggling in Malaysia. Go to Indonesia. There are three million people born there every year. You, you can't yeah. set up a clinic here, go over there. They need, they need like 20 hospitals every six months. That's, this is for new ones, and there are hundreds in backlog. So there's a huge opportunity. Look outside Malaysia, and let's see this. And that's only just one country. And you know, the Philippines is now starting to blossom a bit. Uh, Thailand, of course, has always been there. So it's, yeah. it's difficult. It's very not easy. But I think there is certainly a de demand supply imbalance. Uh, if the Malaysians are wanted here, they're definitely wanted in large other countries. But I think Southeast Asia is, is, is certainly the future. I mean, there are, there are other industry-specific things, be in the right industry, right? Okay. If you can get into IT. Like the other day, I was talking to someone who was a 20-year-old uh, gentleman, young lad who wanted to get into the IT industry. Yeah. So smart. 
unbelievable smart. And the country is full of that. And I think, you know, if you can get into the IT industry, it would be even better. I thought it's IT, healthcare, for example. Malaysia, yeah. unfortunately, we're not having the same kind of babies that we used to have. Oh, Dr. Rasni, I'm not going to ask you any questions about that. I've got five kids, right? I'm sure all of them will not have five kids each. So I have like two, one, three, average of two, which means by 2050, we will be an aged society. We're now aging. So healthcare is another huge opportunity for us. And same thing in, in other countries. So pick an industry, make it work right through the tide. But, but I think from an employee standpoint, it's going to be like, I'm, I'm 53. I'm a Gen X. In a few years' time, I'm technically a retiree, right? So all the ones who are in Gen Y and millennials and Gen Z, I think they'll do, they'll do okay. The ones, the ones in my era, they're the ones who have to, they will have to survive until retirement, I think. It really is a matter of adapting as you go, understanding the future, future a little bit. And it helps, it's, it helps a lot to have a good boss. As you know, the others say, the company, uh, employees join companies, but they leave bosses. Always look All right. for a good team and a good boss. All right. Sorry, I don't have to intervene here. So I just wanted to get Dr. Azni's take as well on this. Just probably uh, what your inputs are as well, Dr. Azni. Yes, the short one. Uh, the younger generations are far more agile and adaptive if you compare to the uh, our generation, me and Rob. Uh, but to be honest, uh, each generation comes with its own value. Uh, and uh, the younger generation, though they are far more agile and uh, adaptive, uh, they get bored quite fast. So it, that's why I, uh, I think I want to pick up where uh, Rob stopped just now, you know. Uh, selecting the right industry. If you are a very dynamic person, then find an industry that is dynamism, a very high dynamism, yeah. Uh, if you're somebody who is a more stable mindset, then choose a more stable industry. Finding the fit. The personality fit is not just intellect anymore. It's about finding the right kind of uh, uh, propensity for change, I guess. If you are uh, someone who is looking for something very exciting, then uh, Rob said it very well. The world is your backyard. Yeah, Don't limit yourself to just Malaysia. Uh, I think we have so much potential. And I see it in our students mm -hmm. every day. Um, the capability is really, you know, the younger ones are very, very agile, but we just need to teach them how to navigate through technology. You know, there's too many information. I think they grow in a generation where information overdose is a more problem than getting information um, during our time. Searching for information is super hard, but now sifting through the information is critical. So critical thinking is more important now as opposed to before. So... Uh, for me, for the younger generation, have more critical thinking. For the current workforce, adaptability, agility, flexibility, and readiness for change. I mean, that's pretty much the two that we're looking at, yeah? All right. So I think uh, thanks a lot for that, Dr. Azni. So in terms of the final question of the day, just a quick conclusion with regards to... Uh, we see what we've talked about today. How do you see Malaysia progressing and embracing technological adoption within the next five years, per se? Rob, or me? Sorry. Oh, that was me. Sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you lost me, Emma. I saw the, <laughs> the thing. I got a bit distracted. Um, <laughs> okay. What was the question again? Sorry. <laughs> Basically, how do you see Malaysia embracing this? Oh, right. Okay, okay, yes. Uh, to me, I'm not worried about Malaysia. Uh, I think our workforce, uh, you know, one thing I, I really believe in Malaysia is that we have a very nice culture of collaboration. Uh, mm. we, are, we live in a collective culture. And the idea of uh, collaborating and uh, tolerance, and I think the only, if we can push for agility, uh, a little bit more and flexibility a little bit more uh, to me uh, we will grow we will grow very far I mean with the advent of uh, you know China booming and growing uh, I think uh, you know our country's relationship with any country in the world I mean this is our core competency as a country where we are we can collaborate with literally any other country and I'm not worried about us at all. We are high on collaboration and we live in an era where uh, the capability to collaborate is the key competitive advantage. 
and okay. we do have it uh, as people and as a country. So um, I see us growing. All right. Probably, Rob, you can add on something to that to conclude. Uh, Rob, mute. I think you're on mute. Oh, I'm sorry. Now, I would just, if I can add a little bit to what Dr. Asti mentioned. I think she kind of nailed it already. The only thing I wanted to add is really book more about uh, innovation cycles. So, you know, um, I've been involved in economic development in several countries, including Malaysia, and advising on institutional development. And so I'll put, I'll, I'll put something which is a bit of a lesson learned for Malaysia in general. But I think this lesson learned has been, is now starting to change as well. And then we we have gone from decade to decade and era to era with new catchphrases from automotive, MSC, and then biotech and such like. So, and I, I think I'd ask quite as a question was you know wish, Vision 2020 a failure? So of course not. Without Vision 2020, that lift would never have happened. People wouldn't have this ambition to become modern, and that's been achieved. Um, but having said all that, you know, the, 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 the king for technology as a, as a process adapt, uh, adoption is how innovation works. Innovation has many dimensions, but the one I like to look at is the innovation cycle, compatibility of the cycle. So, for example, if you pick ITs and software, that is the most dynamic sector in the world. Anyone can come in, anyone can be destroyed, anyone can be, become huge. The product can come in every, every day. The exact opposite is aerospace. Nothing happens without FAA in Yasa. It's the slowest and also very lucrative. So in between, there are many, many different cycles. We just have to now slow down and say, what cycles do we have? Maybe it's not just one cycle for every country. It is many cycles for many countries. Yeah. And for many parts of, of many cycles for many parts of Malaysia. And where is the compatibility? For example, semiconductor is a slow cycle right brand new platform comes out every 30 to 40 to 40 years and it's every innovation is seven to eight years we somehow kind of went into it in the 60s 70s but we kind of dropped out in the 80s and 90s because we got too excited in, in, in software nothing wrong with that but the thing we need to do now is move forward into technology adoption technology develop, development is to, to realign and understand from a policy standpoint what cycles are, compa are, are compatible to us. Another one is energy, batteries and such like. It's a very slow cycle, but it's also very compatible to, to what we do. And I'm starting to see that people are, are, are waking, up, uh, waking up to that. And I think uh, this is where the future, future will be. All these other things that we are seeing every other day, uh, I, I think that'll take time for us to, to, to adapt and, and to adopt. Now, I always found in Malaysia that sometimes we are guilty of watching the production from the, from the audience standpoint, mm -hmm. where we should be make, watching, doing the production from a producer standpoint. And that's much more integrated. If you, if you recall what I mentioned about B2B uh, e-commerce, right? 90% of e-commerce is behind the scenes. And we are starting to we're starting to, to to do that now. So I think all the things that I mentioned earlier about different sectors, and as Dr. As mentioned, we are we are on the right way. It's not going to be uh, it's not going to be easy. It's not it's going to be very messy. But I think we are now in that point where okay, we're not satisfied with how things are going. Now the change is going to happen, and maybe the next generation right. alongside our generation will make it work. All right. Thanks a lot, Rob for that and thanks a lot to Dr. Azni as well. Those are the prepared themes that we have for this week. I think now we'll move on to the Q&A section in terms of getting some questions from the comments for you guys to answer as well. And I'll probably will try to limit the questions to, because there's quite a number of questions, we'll try to limit it as short as possible, probably two minutes each. There's one from Ruben Kumar here that says, Innovation ideas are usually strong from startups and new tech companies are always trying to leverage the IR 4.0 ecosystem. Do you think Malaysian tech startups receive enough support to advance? Funds, policies, coaching, fairgrounds to compete, etc. They could be the key for us in bridging the gap with our C counterparts. Uh, Rob or Dr. Azni, would you like to take this on? I'm okay to start. Doc, I just want to do a doctor. Go ahead, Rob. Okay, okay, so this is a, a question specific to IR4, right? 
Um, but it's the same kind of it's, it's the same kind of theme that we see across all kind of innovation in, initiatives, and and you find with entrepreneurs the number one thing to look for is is, is funding. Um, the, the good thing about IR four point zero, uh, IR four point zero. Generally speaking, right? Because because there, there's a few aspects of it. One is the equipment aspect of it, which means the equipment used in a certain sector, so that sector can take part in industry four point zero. Another aspect of industry 4.0 is the actual core part, which is what sector is now adopting on IR 4.0 and what disruption is happening. And the third part is the services aspect of it, which is, you know, what are the what kind of people, what kind of uh, uh, what kind of customer services are, are coming to it. So it's a very very uh, uh, broad field. But one one of the things where it's different with industry 4.0, it is much more stratified. It's a lot more organized. It's a lot more rigid. So, for example, if I can just go into uh, something which both Dr. Rasti and I are somewhat familiar with, is the aerospace sector, right? It is, it is really like the Quran. It's very specific, <laughs> very specific. You know, if you want to do any innovation, you need, a, you need approval from so many layers, right? From one layer, in fact, there's only one layer in approval. <laughs> so, so then, so then, the research, development, the, the even the customer come from a very specific place and you need to prove that you can get into that. So to get into that it itself is a uh, a difficult process. And that's where it becomes the onboarding, right? The onboarding process of an entrepreneur into that into that uh, value chain is incredibly difficult. No government support can achieve that by itself. It requires actually a industrial scale innovation. Uh, and of course, Dr. Rasti's friends and my friends in the aerospace industry are, are going through that process. And you just can't do it by yourself, which is different to the IT industry, right? You get three guys put together, Instagram, you're a billionaire in three years. But that's like a shot in the dark. So, so it's really, it really uh, is it's a different process altogether. And, and, that's, and that's a good thing. That this is what I mentioned earlier about getting things organized. The good thing about the Malaysian industry, Malaysian government, Malaysian aerospace industry, Malaysian uh, uh, NGOs and associations, they're saying, listen, for us to serve A or B, Airbus or Boeing and all their suppliers, we need to get our act together, work together. Whoever is crazy enough to do it, let's do it. It may take three years to do it, but we need to show some sweat equity, show some financial equity, and then see who and make sure we like each other, and then we go together to make it work. What I described to you is exactly how the Germans work. They have a club, okay. right? And and that's and that's how it should be done. This this lone wolf IT approach uh, will work in IT, but I have four point oh. It's uh, need need as they say, treat the line. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Rob, for that. Uh, okay. So we'll move on to the next question. And this one's from Iman Shukri. So she said, in Kedah, paddy farmers are using drones for seedling and fertilization of their crops. I find it very exciting to see that happening at Kampung. Would you would like to know what is the most exciting technology adoption panelists have seen in Malaysia? Probably, Dr. Azni, you can start off with this one. Um, okay, uh, I think right now uh, we are doubling into, uh, when we look at tourism, like the Kampung area, right now they are trying to figure out how to use a virtual re reality or augmented reality as part of a tourism marketing uh, okay. where we are looking at uh, how can we give, you know, because one thing about tourism is that you don't want to go to places that you are not very familiar with uh, and the use of augmented reality, you know, you get to experience a little bit and remove a little bit of the fear um, and that for me is quite exciting. Uh, we're going into uh, rejuvenating uh, tourism in the rural area through the use of technology and um, i just give you another one. Um, currently, me and uh, another group of lecturers, we are creating, well, we're, we're in the process of designing biosensors uh, to determine uh, swine DNA uh, in the food. So oh. that is uh, one of the technologies that we want to work on so that now when Muslims travel anywhere around the world, you can easily test whether, you know, is that food... Uh, at least not the halal part, but at least the, the swine DNA will not be present in the food. So that's some, if you didn't have all this technology, you will not be able to create some kind of device. That's very interesting. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that. Uh, 
hopefully it will become a reality in the not too distant future. I think it will be helpful. Uh, we're trying very hard. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll move on to the next question. This one's from Emmeline Yee. Many Malaysian universities are doing technology-related research, yet uh, not many have been commercialized. What is the cause of this phenomenon and how can we tackle this? Probably. Uh, okay, let's go back right. to my story just now, the biosensor. For... <laughs> okay, uh, you have to understand, uh, many times when it comes to university, we are breaking the frontier of uh, understanding technologies. We are not commercializing it. Uh, we live it. I think Rob just now was saying, eh? universities are fundamentals. We're not business people. Uh, then we, that's why right now, universities are working very good, very well with uh, industry. We, we call it uh, university and uh, public-private partnerships. There, there are different ter terminologies there. Uh, yeah. But the commercialization should be done by the private sector. Uh, our role is mainly to break through uh, the development or the sciences behind it and to come up with the uh, biosensor is still very very challenging and to make it into even to make it into something that is this big is another challenge <laughs> I mean you know uh, but I I just tell you uh, the, the real biosensor right now is about uh, it's as big as a table uh, you know uh. Uh, this one so to shrink it, it's going to take years. Okay. So, All right. Thanks a lot, Dr. Azni. I think we'll move on to the final question for Rob here. Uh, I think the question would be, what are the important skills one should acquire uh, moving forward towards the IR 4.0 generation? I think we have dabbled into this a little bit. Probably you can uh, resurface what we've talked about just now as well. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Adam. Uh, and thanks to Kishani. Uh, so I guess the, the point here, the word skills, and I think Dr. Asni, you have to come into it as well. Uh, it's a huge question. It's like saying what skills are required to move towards internet, you know, into the internet, basically. Uh, but I think it, the answer, in essence, is a lot more simple than what it may seem from this seemingly tricky question. Industry 4.0 is just manufacturing, yeah? And I want to make, make it very clear. Manufacturing is not factory work. Many governments around the world, including maybe our own, guilty of equating the two. Manufacturing is design and distribution. That is that 99.999% of manufacturing. And IR 4.0 is just manufacturing in the 21st century. There's no difference, except yeah. now we got tools so that Dr. Asni wants her shoes to be pink and blue instead of just blue. Or, you know, she can do that now. As long as the infrastructure is there, of course, we're not there yet. It's a journey. It's a journey, but it's just manufacturing skills, and manufacturing has many aspects of it. The services component of it. Again, you know, I4 coined in Germany. They're manufacturing behemoth, but manufacturing is less than 25% of their GDP. That's the bit of services. So services is a it's a huge com component of it. So I think that's the main thing I would like to put as a theme because it's too huge a question to answer. But be a good manufacturer. And Malaysia, unfortunately, is not yet a good manufacturer, manufacturing country. We're great in factory work, but manufacturing is where we need to have a mindset, which means who's your customer, what do they want, and why is your product better than your competitor? I know it's a little bit of a mouthful statement, but so is the question. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, Rob. So... I think with that, that concludes the Q&A segment for today. And from me, uh, on behalf of Human Cap, thank you very, very much to Rob and Dr. Azni for joining us today, especially for giving us your insights with regards to all the themes that we've covered today. I'm sure it was uh, very beneficial for all our viewers as well. And with that, thank you very much and have a good day, everybody. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Dr. Azni. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Doc. Assalamualaikum. Yeah, Bye. Thanks. Bye. Human Cap's change management expertise is translated through our consultancy services and our learned programs. Our goal is to assist our clients through their change management journey to make it an effortless and seamless experience using our change management model. Our consultancy services focus on change management delivery with specialization in system integration implementation projects. 
Human Cap has obtained the Qualified Education Provider QEP status from the Association of Change Management Professionals ACMP for our Change Management Certification Program. At Human Cap, we understand your specific needs and strive to incorporate them in our change approach while striving to humanize change to help you better adapt to new systems and processes. Sheen.